Productivity, innovation, and I've got to stop waving my arms around, haven't I, if I'm going to use this microphone. Uh, see, every day is a learning experience. There's something new. Um, I'm not sure I can talk without waving my arms around. So I'm just going to talk about innovation, and I'm just going to cap, sort of pick up on a number of points that have come up over the last couple of days. Um, you know, the issue of gazelles, the issue of goats, that was mentioned in a, a later presentation. Um, I forget what the original uh, relationship, I think it was to buffalo of some kind, but uh, goats appealed to me more because of the intransigence in the character of goats. Um, and I wanted to sort of address the issue of the, the sort of the problem of innovation. And not that innovation in, in and of itself is a problem, but actually the second innovation is the problem. It's very easy as an organisation, as an innovator, to come up with a clever idea, to put something into place, to, to start a new uh, business model. What's really hard is to start another business model after that, and I'll explain why. Um, by the way, I've got about 16 hours worth of slides here, if we go through it all, in the next 30 minutes. Um, I left all the slides in the deck. You know, for you, you can have them, you can read them, you can object to them, you can do anything you like with them. Um, but I'm not going to cover them all, unless you annoy me, in which case I will. <laughs> so, just wanted to ask the difference between innovation and creativity. We've talked a lot about innovation. It's not having clever ideas. It's taking clever ideas and turning them into action, doing something with them. And doing something with them is not a technical process. It's not a, a business process in the pure sense of the term, uh, you know, that you follow a, a, a structured process of going through and collecting ideas and refining ideas and uh, choosing the ones that you put into practice. It's a cultural thing. It's about building a consensus, building a view of the world going forward and getting people on board with change. And that's what innovation is. And I think innovation is great. I'm, I'm one of those strange people who like things to change. I get bored if they stay the same. Um, but the problem is, for innovators, is you've got to get everybody else to come on board as well. You've got to get a sort of groundswell behind your, your idea and actually bring everybody along. And there's a dynamic in business. Once you start the dirty business of actually earning money from your idea, there's a problem that comes in. And it relates to what the last speaker was uh, talking to about the difference between enterprise applications and uh, mobile applications. That They're serving a different purpose in many ways in the organisations that make them. And so I'll try and address those problems in 30 minutes or so. So 16 hours in 30 minutes, I'll speak too fast. I've also, you probably noticed from my lack of an accent that I'm not from around here. Um, <laughs> I do know it's not called ice hockey here. I have learned that in the few days I've been here. So let's, let's have a look at some of these things. And let's be realistic about changing the world. The problem is, um, we're, in many cases, we're all too busy. When you're up to your arse in alligators, it's hard to remember that your job is to drain the swamp. It's very easy, once you get into business, that, that, that survival becomes more important than innovation. Yes? No? Maybe? Um, I couldn't find a, a specifically Canadian example of that. The names of the animals, I thought, gave really bad vibes if you put them in there. And it used to be... <laughs> I'll just leave that one out there for people. <laughs> Interesting, watching who, who, who thought of that first. Um, it used to be that success in business was doing the same things a billion times in a completely repeatable fashion. Yeah? making a billion cars, making, making a billion widgets, whatever it was. Perfect <coughs> delivery was the aim. And that business was about uh, being uh, consistent, repeatable, safe. And you had 20 years of product life in which to do things. It ain't that way anymore. The world is moving faster. What we've got is a, a sort of confluence of, of forces of change. Technology is changing at a very fast rate. Expectations of how people should be served, the social networks are changing. Um, the sort of the ability to communicate information globally is changing. So all these forces come together, and where change happens is at complex intersections, where you get lots of forces coming together. So when people say mobile is about devices, it really isn't. 
People who say it's about data, it really isn't. It's about all of these things coming together to create user experience, to create new business models, new ways of solving the problems that people have in the world. Both business problems, personal problems, social problems, whatever they may be. And you can look into history and see examples of this. Where innovations have happened have been in crossroad cities, places where people's ideas, uh, technologies, things come together to create new opportunities. And you look around the world and there are cities that attract innovation. Uh, you look at Vancouver and say, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting mix, Vancouver, of city and nature. It's unusual in many respects. These kind of cities and university towns create new cultures because you have a mixing kind of effect. So you get these kind of, sort of pockets of innovation around the world. And we're dealing with a lot of changing kind of models in certain terms of society. We've got evolving business models. Everything has to be faster, quicker, more immediate, more engaging, less transactional, more engaging. New models for doing things. Has to be on the web, has to be mobile, has to be anywhere in the world, has to be contextual as well. As I say, that's about five hours worth of conversation all on its own, just, just deconstructing that one. We've got technology coming out of our ears. In fact, we have far more technology in the West than we know what to do with. And the point about outside of the US is really important because what's really interesting is watching the ways Africa and India are actually taking bits of that technology and creating models we hadn't thought of. You know, we haven't got the full answer for the technology. But we've got more technology than we've got business models for yet. We don't know what to do with it all. As bandwidth goes up, as the capabilities of the device cross a threshold, you know, we've got to catch up in terms of how we do business, how we engage with people. Again, make sense? Um, and you can actually see it in the devices. You know, if you look at PCs, if you're old enough to remember PCs, um, when desktop PCs crossed about 700 megahertz in terms of speed, You'd actually got enough power to do all of the sort of normal office kind of stuff. Everything in Microsoft Office, for example, worked fine once you got past 700 megahertz. When you get past one gigahertz, you can start to do speech recognition. You know, you look at the power we now have in our pockets, we have far more power than we're actually taking account of. So we need to do something with it. And young people want to do things differently. When uh, uh, text messaging was first invented, it was given away free by telcos because no one would be able to use a phone as a keyboard. No one. Shows you how wrong you can be, doesn't it? Um, you know, it just... You, we don't understand, in many ways, these new generations, what people refer to as the digital natives, the people who've grown up with technology, who, who interact with it in different ways than we do. And the trouble with all these big trends and disruptions, is they're all linked to one another. You know, a, a brand new shiny device does not solve a problem on its own. It's part of an ecosystem. It has to link into doing something that people actually want to use. Apple were, one, I think, one of the first people who realised that actually what you need to do, it's not so much about the, desire, the device, although you sell the device as a fashion item so you make lots of money, um, it's actually about the ecosystem of applications. It's what you can do with it that actually distinguishes it. Selling a new device on its own doesn't save the world. I'm going to skip over some of these, but we know it's getting worse as well, or better, depending on how you choose to look at these things. In fact, this is one of those slides that you probably need to update every day. I should really talk to the people from Google about getting this slide automatically updated every day for me, because <laughs> there's always something new. Uh, you know nano coatings for, uh, for, for mobile phones to keep the water off them so you, can, so you can drop them in the toilet. Why was he bending over the toilet like that? Does anybody else wonder, worry about that? <laughs> <laughs> New things going on the whole time. The numbers are constantly going up. Um, a lot of these things are interesting, but we haven't figured out how to, how to turn them into businesses yet as well. So what actually generally happens in business, just to be boring for a moment, <laughs> is you come up with some clever idea and you create a competitive advantage. And for a while, that com competitive advantage lets you make money. 
You create a new car, a new, a new service, a new mobile phone app. And in the good old days, you got 20 years to go from there to there. If you're in mining or heavy steel uh, sort of manufacturing kind of industries, you've got 100 years <coughs> to go from there to there because the barriers to entry were so great for everybody. At some point, you need a new innovation, a new way of keeping people out of your turf. Do I jump ahead of everybody else? Or do I come up with some regulations that stop other people competing in my industry? I'm not going to mention the patent wars uh, <coughs> by name, but you know, do I try to use legislation to stop other people competing in my industry? If I'm the US car industry, do I use legislation to, to stop competition for 20 years, to keep that gap alive? Or do I come up with something new? And the reason enterprise applications are so bad, and he's right, most enterprise applications are 30-year-old green screen applications. Uh, 20 years ago, because I'm old, I saw somebody running an uh, uh, SAP on a, uh, an Apple Newton. Do you remember the Apple Newton? <laughs> yeah, liars. <laughs> there are more of you who remember it than you're prepared to admit. Um, and you think, what sort of vicious sociopath did that? <laughs> you know... It's got 40 levels of menus on a screen yay big. You know, that's not the way to true happiness. Um, you know, they d it's a neat trick, um, but it, you know, it's just not funny. Um, so when you talk about making use of new technologies, new innovations, you've actually got to step ahead. But the problem is, I make all my money by doing this repeatedly a million times, by selling SAP the same way. Why would I want to waste a huge amount of money to rewrite it? You know, it's the million line spreadsheet problem. It's not like you've got an alternative. It would cost you too much to go somewhere else, wouldn't it? So, yay. I call this the heroin dealing model, by the way. If that helps, the first one is free. Uh, but that's how it worked. Um, and I have a terrible memory for names, I should say. So the, the gentleman who spoke from Deloitte's uh, yesterday, who was talking about the five years. Um, what's happened over time is technology has advanced and business cycles have advanced. The gap that you have to, to uh, earn your money have become shorter, shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. You need to innovate more. Well, we can go back and be very protective and stop people competing with us completely. But I need to, I need to deal with these things faster. Five years. Actually, I'd say that was probably you know, an optimistic estimate with a lot of business models today. What was happening five years ago? The iPhone was new. Yeah? And yes, I do have my iPhone with me. Just so, just so we establish that I am stylish. <laughs> Because you can't tell from looking at me. <laughs> I also have my Android with me. Um, I have to go to the other room. And I do have my BlackBerry K10 with me as well. <laughs> I don't have a, um, a, a Microsoft phone. Not because I dislike the Microsoft phone. But I just have this fear that if I had a Microsoft phone, a big sign would come up. You know, level one completed, beginning level two. <laughs> Uh, and I'm not sure I could cope with that. Um, they are not innovation in and of themselves. And the fact that they have different operating systems is actually to lengthen my competitive advantage. Because I'm going to sort of lock you into one of these phones and, uh, and carry that forward as a business model. And I'll use patent wars to fight off my competition as well. Because apparently things having rounded corners is a unique idea that nobody ever thought of before. <laughs> I worry about the USA sometimes. Uh, but um, but it's, it's, these are serious, serious issues in business. So let's, let's move on a bit. You know, information technology, social change are, are affecting all of these things. People need to be more dynamic. You need to actually be able to deal with these changing situations, with these changing services. 
Um, you know, it's got to be about engagement now, not transaction. You know, you look at the internet, the internet went through a series of phases. Well, on day one, everybody looked at the internet and said, we don't know what that's for. Um, you know, what they did was they published their company brochure on it. Yeah? Then, oh, we can actually receive email from, from our customers. Level two. Now we can actually talk to our customers. They can email us, we can e email them back. Now we can have a transactional relationship with them. We can buy and sell things with those people. Now we can go one step further. We can have an engagement with those people. So multiple generations. And I think the problem of, of, of sort of saying what the future of mobility is going to be is we haven't been through those generations yet. We've got, to, we've got to work out what actually works in mobility, what works in these sort of business kind of models. So there's going to be experiments. There'll be some dead ends. It's an evolutionary model for those who, who believe in evolutionary models. For those who don't believe in evolutionary models, we have to hope that the people making each of these devices have applied intelligent design to it. I like to cover all the possibilities in my audience. <laughs> Everywhere in the world is becoming connected and, and instant on. Africa, India, they're connecting in different ways. They're using mesh networking. They're linking up networks themselves. Um, it's very interesting to see they have a very difficult, t different take on it. Why aren't we doing that? Because of the lag of what we've already got. The companies that have invested in huge infrastructures that have built transnational networks of fibre. The drag of the old stops you adopting the new. If you look at adoption of the first generation of mobile phones, it was slower in America because people had invested in pagers. So they actually jumped two generations. They didn't adopt mobile phones until second generation mobile phones came out. So the drag of the old is what kills you. And if you were wondering what kills innovation, the drag of the old. Because once you've done something clever, you have to keep doing it, the same thing, in a structured, safe, reliable kind of way. And that's antithetical to innovation. <coughs> if I'm trying to be safe, secure, I'm not being innovative. I'm going to skip ahead a few. The key thing with a lot of this is asking the right question and being output focused. The big change from the old enterprise days was we were input focused, where IT is expensive and complicated and difficult. The limitation is what you can buy, what you can put in place. This is why IT departments are the groups telling you what you can't do, because they're managing a budget. Yeah? Or do none of you have that problem with your IT? IT gives you everything you want, bring your own device, fine. Come in tomorrow. IT manage, in most organisations manages to a budget. People who manage to a budget and manage on the basis of not being, having a, a service outage, making a mistake, are not innovative people. They are people who will keep the status quo. It's the sensible way to go. So your five-year-old company where you started as a vast, innovative, brand new force, once you start to get a bit successful, that has the seeds of its own doom built into it. Because you start having to protect your position. You start having to concentrate more on delivering in an efficient way rather than being innovative. There are people who say the only answer to that is actually to start a new company and innovate there rather than try to continue to innovate in your existing uh, sort of organisation. That's a kind of slightly pessimistic view. You know. You can look even at very large companies like IBM, which, which successfully reinvented itself uh, you know, from being a hardware company to being a services company. It was painful, loud, took a long time. It can be done. But there are very sort of limited ways in which you can make those things happen. Let's ask a few questions about you. What is it? This is actually Maslow's hierarchy of needs. He was a psychologist, a sociologist. And he was talking about people. But you can actually use it about companies. Um, what do you want from life? You know, are you about saving the world? Are you about survival? Cranking the handle, making low margins on every item. Um, but, you know, good regular income. I'm not sure I particularly want intimate relations with some companies. Um, but that may just be me. <laughs> If you're up here, 
it's easy to be innovative. And it's kind of a bit like being, you know, left wing when you're young. At some point you wake up and think, on TV when they were talking about taxing those rich people, when did that become me? <laughs> when did I move from there to there? You know, is it about family? Is it about, you know, bringing up children? But companies do the same thing. I come up with a good idea. And it's very easy then to slip down into here. Safety, security, cranking the handle, doing the same thing over and over again. Making, a, making the product good, but not changing the world. You need to look at the culture of your organisation. And even within your organisation, we have, if you're managed to a budget, you're going to be down here. Because if you do something clever up there, to save the company millions of dollars, you'll get into trouble for blowing your budget. Yeah? Somebody else gets the benefit. IT can't be a separate cost centre going forward. That's one of the problems of enterprise IT. IT is a service delivering what business needs. It's got to be going forward. Otherwise, there'll be the people telling you you can't bring your own device to the office because of my security, you know, my enterprise security. And you see this transition in companies. You get companies that start up and they, you know, start up in the cloud and they start up on the web. And when they start to get a little bit of data that is important to them, customer records, financial data, they suddenly get all normal and say, well, actually, I, I suddenly now need to have some IT internally in my company and move back. Because that's my secret source. That's, that's, you know, secure. I need disaster recovery. The things I didn't worry about up at the top there. Um, you know, being successful is a trap in its own right. You can let it become a trap. So let's look at innovation very briefly. There's little eye innovation, which everybody should be doing anyway, which is making things incrementally better all the time. Yeah? And there's... Big eye innovation, doing radical things, <coughs> changing things. There's about a couple of dozen ways of describing this, red ocean and blue ocean strategies uh, and all these kind of things. But the whole point with all of this is what am I trying to achieve? Where am I trying to go? These bottom couple of levels here are incremental. I just improve things. Up here... I'm trying to change the world, change the way I do business, change my business model. Take SAP and turn it into a service orientated architecture with a full uh, mobile interface. By the way, if you're thinking of doing that, that's kind of hard. It's a really big, complicated system. So what am I trying to achieve? And is my organisation set up? Because it's a cultural thing. Am I set up so that I can actually achieve that? It's not about does the technology exist to do it. The technology does exist to do it. Do I have the will? Do I have the organisational backing? Do I have a governance mechanism that will actually allow me to do this kind of stuff? Or have I kind of built a wall into my organisation that's actually going to kill off innovation in five years? I genuinely believe it will become less than five years going forward. And what is it I'm innovating? Do I just want to, to, as Henry Ford referred to it, if I asked people what they would have said they wanted was a faster horse? Um, <laughs> instead, he gave them a car. That may or may not have been a good thing. We can talk about that later on. You know, do I want to become a service? Rolls-Royce Aerospace. They make big jet engines for commercial jets. Um, they want to be a service organisation because an engine lasts 20 to 30 years in life. And the life of the engine generates more revenue, more money, than just the build and sell of an engine. And that money was going to somebody else. So they are now a service company. It's flight hours. So when your plane is flying, Rolls-Royce or General Electric are getting paid. If the engine's stopped on the ground, or if it's worse still in maintenance, they're not getting paid. So am I a product? Am I a service? Am I a process, a way of doing things? Am I a business model? It says the internet there, but the internet's kind of complex in that sense. There are several business models within it. Mobility as well. Where are the business models in mobility? Where's the money in all of this? When do I innovate? 
Basically, most people innovate down there. When the pain and the blood and the revenue has got so bad... Um, and you go to meetings and you hear lots of stupid <laughs> questions like, why are we not selling enough laptops? Um, wrong question. Uh, it's actually people aren't buying laptops because they're buying something else. The business model has moved on. Um, this is this thing of asking the right question. One of the things I've learned over a long and cynical lifetime is um, <laughs> common sense is remarkably uncommon. Um, if you went to the doctors with a high temperature... And he said, oh, here's a tablet that will bring your, your temperature down. Uh, would you go away happy? Or would you kind of want to know, actually, what was wrong with me? What's making my temperature go up? And couldn't we fix that instead? You know, that might have better long-term sort of prognosis from a health point of view. But, you know, if we, we get so used to selling widgets that we start to worry about how we sell more widgets. We actually need to be looking for our new innovations up here, where it's not so painful to the organisation and we don't have to move in haste. Um, but luckily, most people ignore that and I'll wait till something horrible happens. I like innovation. Innovation is great. It's fun. It's interesting. It gives me the feeling that I'm doing something useful in the world. Um, most people think I'm a, a blithering maniac. Because our delivery people think it's horrible that I'm smashing up their, their, their jobs. I'm just making their lives difficult. I'm changing a successful business model. I don't really have time to tell the story, but, but as part of my history, I managed to kill off a $6.1 billion line of business for the people I worked for once. Uh, it's one way of getting your name known. <laughs> I don't necessarily recommend it, by the way. <laughs> but why? Because it's obvious. It's the right thing to do. It's obvious. I was actually having a conversation with somebody last week um, where he was, t you know, he was talking about high-performance computing and how obvious it was that we needed more high-performance computing. And he said, that's the trouble with management. I've explained it to them over and over again. I've shown them the million-line spreadsheets, and they don't get it. And it's kind of, you know... You've, you've got to explain it so people can understand it. You've got to explain how it takes the business forward, how it actually contributes something, not it's a great idea or it's a shiny, shiny. How does it affect my business? How does it tether to what we do? How does it affect people's jobs in the organisation? And they think you're a maniac. <laughs> oh, I spelt that wrong. <laughs> Maniac is definitely not spelt relational equity. <laughs> Your idea wasn't ready yet. Um, you know, I've got this great idea, you know, using nanotechnology that doesn't exist yet. Um, oh, and by the way, this, this destroys our business model and puts all of the people who work for us out of business. Not the best sell. Or you're just a blithering idiot and didn't actually know what you were talking about. <laughs> But the sane reaction from a company that is in business to make money, to deliver services to people, is to be wary of innovation. The why innovation is hard is because the process of making money in business, of replicating a process, is antithetical to innovation. There is a, a flat opposition between those people. Now, if you've got another 15 and a half hours... We can go through, through a lot more slides and a lot more detail of, of how that works. Uh, hopefully that was useful. If not, hopefully you've got, at least got a laugh out of it. You're perfectly at liberty to disagree with any of these things. And I'm happy to answer a question. One question. So it's better be a good one. I generally don't hit people in meetings. <laughs> well, at least not when other people are watching, anyway. Here we go. John's got one. So having run a bunch of businesses over the years, I, I eventually had to come to some kind of conclusion as to how to tell when something was innovative as opposed to not. What's your rule of thumb? Oh. I would go back to the point about different types of innovation. Um, 
Uh, if we're using innovation to mean more radical or disruptive things, um, uh, I would look, look for something that establishes a line of, of want, um, that is output-based, not input-based, uh, that serves a want that the community either has or could, uh, could have. I tell a story sometimes uh, how I invented the, the iPod. Um, the problem was, uh, years ago, uh, I, I used to go to school by train, um, and um, it was dull. So I borrowed a dictaphone, for those old enough to remember <coughs> dictaphones, from my father, small um, cassette player. And I recorded some music on it, and I would listen to it through a very tinny earphone. So I could claim that I invented the Sony Walkman <laughs> and the iPod. The problem is, I never realised that at the important part of that process, that this was an innovation. This was something other people would pay money for that it was a service that would be useful to other people. So some guy in Japan copied my idea <laughs> and, and invented the Walkman. Um, I think looking at innovation, the hardest thing first is genuinely is recognising there's an innovation here. Because quite often when you spend a lot of time coming up with something and doing something, it becomes obvious to you and you forget that it's an innovation. If it's going to change the business, change the world, how will it go forward? How do I make a business model from it? And how does it affect existing models? Is it a modification of an existing business model? Is it a change to an existing model? Have I rearranged the bricks of an industry to do something in a different way? Amazon would be a very good example of that. They took the basic bookshop process and took away the bookshop. <laughs> 